Just such an example of intensive overseas training can be seen in our next big picture story. As we go to Okinawa and a special operation in amphibious training. The operation lasted for almost a week, and it started off, as most of them do, with a briefing. Aboard a Navy craft cruising off Okinawa's White Beach, we received instructions from a Naval Lieutenant on the care and use of the latest life jackets. One thing about amphibious work, no matter how much you know, there's always more to learn from someone who's had a different kind of experience. Life jackets are an important part of our gear, and though all of us, if I must say so myself, are darn powerful swimmers, we never fail to take them along when we can. When the briefing was finished, we put the life rafts over the side. Life rafts play a big role in amphibious work, First, we made some runs towed at high speed by an LCPR. In combat situations, towing can be used to move the life rafts within paddling distance of shore. Then we cut away from the towing boat and paddle in on our own. Hour after hour, as the sun mounted higher over the Pacific, we practice stroking along through the bobbing, pitching ocean waves. Perhaps the combat situation calls for us to make a covert landing, where even small life rafts might be noticed by the enemy. So, a landing craft speeds our raft close to the enemy shore, and on signal, we go into the water to swim the rest of the way. The other side of the coin, recovery, is a lot trickier. From a speeding landing craft, it's like scooping up fish with a net. And once in a while, one gets away. It takes perfect coordination, a good eye, and a mighty strong back. Parachute recovery is another of our jobs. Caught in a sudden wind, two jumpers are carried out to sea. Go get them, is the order. One trooper landed not far from the LCPR, and almost immediately we were closing in on him. Paddling into position, one of us dove off the raft to swim the rest of the way to the chute. It takes a lot of know-how to help the paratrooper without becoming entangled in the sodden, water-soaked web of the chute. At the same time, a few hundred yards away, other special operations men were hauling in the second paratrooper. Outside of a saltwater dunking, he is none the worse for wear. And his chute, too, will live to fly again another day. All this rugged training spells out why amphibious forces are relied on for so many big jobs. Come along on a simulated mission against a mock enemy known as Aggressor. Oh, 0600 hours. We scrambled down to a landing craft a few miles offshore from an Aggressor-held island. 
0615 hours. Aboard a submarine nearing the island, more men from our group are ready for their part in the mission. 0630 hours. The motors on the submarine are cut. Men of the Army Special Operations Detachment ascend the ladder to the decompression chamber. 0-6. It's still early dawn as the submarine moves up to the surface. And one by one, the specially trained soldiers come out of the chamber onto the deck. Navy men keep an alert eye, and finally the last of the amphibious detachment is out of the submarine. By 0645 hours, the party from the submarine is en route to a previously designated offshore point. There, a rendezvous will be made with the special operations men from the landing craft. Seven hundred hours. Underwater demolition teams leave the landing craft. It is an eerie, nightmarish scene as, like strange giant fish, they glide gracefully in toward the aggressor held island. From the shore, no sign of the oncoming attack. No sign, no sound, no smell for the aggressor guard to notice. to lose now. By 0715, depth charges are planted on the surf-covered beach. And the attacking unit jumps aboard life rafts to clear the island before the explosion. 0730 hours and right on schedule. It may still be early morning, but off the coast of Okinawa, a big day's work has been done by the fighting frogmen of the Army's Special Operations Detachment.